Welcome to Inbox Roundup number 24, where I answer your questions. Today we're going to talk about hazing rituals in the U.S. Armed Forces, why Israel's airspace was able to be defended but not Ukraine's, the efficacy of turtle tanks, how NATO would fight against an entrenched enemy, how the U.S. prevents rogue nuclear attacks, and why doesn't body armor cover more than just the chest? Well, let's get started. So, uh, Madia asks, I'm interested in hazing rituals in the U.S. Armed Forces, more specifically the U.S. Army, as you have personal experience with it. I'd like to learn what rituals are common, their impact on service members, and some personal experience you might be willing to share, such as the limited info you shared with the Data of China video. Uh, so, in general, there's two types of hazing rituals. One is a rite of passage. The other is abuse of power. Now, Data of China is a Russian word that means rule of the grandfathers, and this has been a tradition in the Russian army since like the 1960s or 1970s, but it got worse during Afghanistan, and it still continues in some forms today. Essentially, Soviet soldiers and later Russian soldiers were drafted for a two-year term, and the second-year soldiers would haze the first-year soldiers. Uh, today, Russia only drafts for one year, although with the war in Ukraine, that might be a little up in the air. Uh, but this kind of date of chain, that this wasn't um, rite of passage hazing, it was abuse of power. Everything from stealing food to demanding that the conscripts give you cigarettes to pimping out first-year conscripts. Now, the U.S. military, for the most part, the hazing is a rite of passage, although occasionally it can go too far. For example, when I was in, when you got your airborne wings, uh, those wings would be placed in your uniform, and then someone would punch the pin spikes into your chest, and you'd be bleeding all over. It hurt, but it was tradition. And as far as I know, this has been prohibited since maybe the late 90s when CNN ran a story on U.S. Marines doing this. We also had a ceremony called Turning Blue at infantry school where the pins from your cross rifles were punched into your chest by your drill sergeants. It hurt, but it was worth it. Uh, today, most hazing is a rite of passage. And probably the most famous is the line crossing ceremony. This happens on U.S. Navy ships when they cross the equator. Uh, all sailors pay homage to King Neptune, and uh, they have to go through these trials, and then afterwards they get a certificate. It's actually kind of a really neat ceremony. And there are some other events like, like dining ins where you attend a formal dinner that has a lot of ceremony, and if you break etiquette during that ceremony, it requires that you drink from the bowl of grog, which is this mess of, of alcohol, uh, although there, there is a non-alcoholic form of grog for, for Mormons and, and people who don't drink. Um, but uh, you drink from the grog as a form of punishment if you violate the rules of the mess. And, and by the way, if anyone ever wants to invite me to a dining in as your Mr. Vice, I'd make a great Mr. Vice. Uh, but probably the biggest hazing ritual that is shared by most of the armed forces are something called runarounds. Um, this is where you ask like a new private to, uh, hey, uh, go see Sergeant so-and-so, get a can of squelch for the radio. And, well, there's no such thing as a can of squelch for the radio. Squelch is a dial on the radio. Uh, and so the private goes to see that sergeant, and the guy's in on the joke. He goes, oh, yeah, I think Sergeant Johnson has that. So the private goes and sees Sergeant Johnson, and Sergeant Johnson sends him to Sergeant Smith, and so on and so on and so on. And this kind of keeps the soldier running around until they find an NCO who doesn't like to play that game. And I was one of those NCOs. Uh, or the private figures out, like, oh, this is a prank, right? And there's other runarounds like, hey, go get me 100 yards of flight line. Uh, you need to do a density check for the tank armor. So guys are like pounding on the armor with a metal stake or a mallet. Uh, or uh, go get the canopy repair kit. <laughs> yeah, go get the in-flight canopy repair kit, right? Like those things don't exist, but it makes the soldier run around. I think um, the Navy uh, does like a mail buoy. Like they tell sailors who are on watch, hey, you got to go look out for the mail buoy. Um, but... <laughs> I'll tell you this, speaking of rituals, there is one ritual that I do every day, and that's keeps. Look, uh, I'm balding. And since 96% of my audience is male and 54% of you are over the age of 35, that means a good two-thirds of you, or 3.3 million of my viewers right now, are balding. Right along with me. Yeah, I'm thinning up here, but I'm doing something about it with keeps. Keeps allows you to get professional care for hair loss from the comfort of your own home without ever visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy. It is shipped discreetly to your door. So head to keeps.com slash Ryan Macbeth to get a special offer. Complete an online consultation to get matched with a provider who will tailor a treatment plan, if medically appropriate, to address your hair loss concerns. 
All treatment plans are personalized to address your unique needs and recommended by a licensed medical provider specially trained in men's hair loss. And you can cancel your plan at any time. Keeps also has hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade. These products work together to complement your treatment plan. And most men notice results within six months of starting treatment. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video and for the free product. Head over to Keeps.com slash Ryan McBeth to get the special offer. Individual results may vary. Adair asks, how come the UK and US defend Israel with all their might, yet they barely help Ukraine now? So this question probably refers to that massive Iranian missile attack uh, against Israel back in April of 2024, where multiple nations rose to the occasion to defend Israel, not just the US and UK. But why was this coalition willing to do this for Israel and not Ukraine? Some of that's practicality. Ukraine is 26, 27 times larger than Israel. There's just more area that you have to defend. The other reason is that in order to reach Israel, these missiles had to fly over a number of friendly nations, all of whom were interested in shooting these missiles down. Uh, if there were a few NATO countries between Ukraine and Russia, yeah, we would probably be able to shoot those weapons down, but that just isn't the case in the current operational environment. Seth asks, I was hoping you would talk about the Russian turtle tanks and related to the overall economics of the war. So uh, these turtle tanks are an evolutionary step to respond to an emerging threat. Uh, these are tanks that have improvised shells of armor on them to deflect or reduce the power of FPV, first person view drones and loitering munitions. And you know, I never did a video about the turtle tanks because many other people did better videos than what I could do. So I really didn't have anything to add. But when it comes to economics, the turtle tank is a, is a relatively cheap way of solving a problem. You create a standoff layer of armor between the loitering munition or the FPV drone and you. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I didn't want to do this video is that I, I'm not into making fun of the Russians. They're really doing something that the U.S. did back during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we put a lot of wacky armor on our vehicle. We did a lot of things to try to stop the IED, the uh, Improvised Explosive Device Threat. Uh, during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there was an organization called Task Force Troy, and they were tasked with figuring out how to defeat roadside bombs. And their patch had the characters from a mad magazine called uh, Spy vs. Spy on it. And this was a very appropriate symbol, because the, the spies are constantly trying to one-up each other. And in Iraq, you know, we, we first put Mad Max uh, armor on our Humvees. And then we used up-armored kits. So the Iraqis started using explosively formed projectiles, or EFPs. So we put Rhino mounts in our Humvees to trip the EFP sensor so the EFP would go into the Rhino instead of the vehicle. So then the Iraqis started offsetting their sensor and the EFP. And on and on and on and on. So it's really not much of, a, of an economic thing, although the armor is relatively cheap compared to building a whole new tank. It's just the latest phase of the war. Sooner or later, Ukraine will develop a way to destroy these turtle tanks, and then Russia will counter with something else in a couple months. It's spy versus spy. Measure, countermeasure. Rob asks, how would NATO fight against a well-dug-in army with tank traps, millions of mines, and thousands of many portable anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons along with drones everywhere? That is a good question, and we already have an answer. The answer is Operation Desert Storm. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, and then he dug in behind what he called the Saddam Line. And he hoped that either the U.S. wouldn't invade, or if they did, they would run into multiple defensive positions. Landmines, flaming trenches, barbed wire. And what we did was we just bombed Iraq for a good six weeks straight. Uh, I think we even used B-52s to carpet bomb Iraqi trenches on the border. I was in high school during Desert Storm, but when I enlisted, my squad leader, he had been in a unit on the border with Iraq, and he said he could feel the bomb concussions in his chest, and he was a mile away. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it's believable. And when we invaded, thousands of starving Iraqis came out of their trenches to surrender. Some fought, many didn't. And regarding the minefields and trenches, you know, we just bulldozed them in. In some cases, we just bulldozed Iraqis alive, right, un into the trench. And that's how we breached. We just took a bulldozer, bulldozed everything aside, and went right through that breach. So the answer is that today, NATO would conduct a massive air campaign until the adversary was attrited to the point where we would end up assaulting groups of starving, thirsty men. 
who had very few remaining supplies. Uh, trenches and minefields are great, but if nobody is overwatching the minefields, it, it turns a big problem of breaching that minefield into a smaller problem. It's still dangerous, it's still a problem, but it's a lot easier to breach a wire mined obstacle or conduct a trench attack if nobody is, is opposing you because we've bombed them or they fled or they've surrendered. Steven asks, with the successes of cheap drones, scout and attack, and mobile launchers in Ukraine, why did the Taliban not employ these weapons? So for the most part, this is a relatively new technology. I mean, radio-controlled hobby planes have been around since like the 1930s. Uh, I believe the first commercial drones were introduced in the early 2000s or so. DJI didn't start making hobby drones until 2013. And while they weren't the first company, they were able to make them cheap. And they just basically flooded the market with these cheap drones. So I guess drones really didn't enter uh, the, the, the Taliban's uh, arsenal of weapons because what they had was just kind of working for them. Um, you know, the Taliban operated in small insurgent cells. They used motorcycles. Uh, they would communicate by passing a message to your uncle who would then tell your cousin who would then tell your brother. Um, and that was working. So why even change it? Just operating in small cells, uh, they were able to inflict a lot of damage on coalition forces. So I, I just don't think that drones were something they needed to do in order to accomplish their objectives. Uh, one trap I would not fall into is, uh, you know, I was never in Afghanistan, but I knew people who did go to Afghanistan. And you might go into a village and it looks like the year 700, but then you go into some dude's house, he has a TV, a satellite dish. So it's not like you know, the Afghans didn't know about modern technology. And they certainly aren't stupid. But the, I just don't think that this particular tactic was useful to them because what they had was working well enough. Philip asks, in the book and movie of the same name, some of all fears, it deals with a nuclear terrorist attack on U.S. soil. How does the U.S. plan to prevent such attacks and how would we respond to such attacks? So a lot of that comes down to the fact that enriching uranium is hard and it costs a lot of money. In fact, the some of all fears needed to start with a pit of plutonium for the movie to even happen. And, you know, while you're writing a thriller novel, it's really easy to say the bad guys steal a nuclear weapon from Russia or whatever, right? But it's, it's easy to write that, but it's not so easy to accomplish that. So I guarantee you that both the U.S. and Russia have operations ongoing right now to catch people who are trying to purchase nuclear material. It is in nobody's best interest to allow a non-state actor to get their hands on a nuclear bomb. As for how we would respond, the National Guard has 57 National Guard civil support teams scattered throughout the country. These teams can be deployed upon the use or the threat of any kind of weapon of mass destruction, and they train all the time with civil authorities to respond to these kinds of emergencies. Finally, Jack asks, in a Liska war like Ukraine, wouldn't soldiers, especially stationary ones, benefit from arm and shoulder armor, or even protecting the ribs and the chest and back plates? Uh, even if some degree of leg armor would probably be helpful if grenades start rolling into your trench. I understand a full kit uh, is, isn't light, but if you're defending a trench, would that even matter much? So armor is always a trade-off between protection and mobility. And there are kits for deltoid protection and groin protection. Uh, but the real answer doesn't have to do with mobility. It has to do with water. Every soldier needs three to four liters of water per day and six to 12 liters in a hot environment. So for every kilo of armor you carry, you can carry one less kilo of water. And even if you're in a trench and not moving, you're still sweating and your armor doesn't breathe. So by adding more armor, you're increasing the logistical need to get more water up to the lines. And if you take a look at Ukraine, they have enough trouble getting food and water to fighting positions through Russian artillery shells. Now imagine trying to have to double that amount of water that you're pushing to the front. So that's why. Uh, not only will additional armor impede your movement, uh, but you're going to need a heck of a lot more water. And if you want your question answered, send me an email. It's on my website. And, you know, I, I wrote a short story called Warlock. It's about an Irish traveler who teams up with the FBI to go after the world's most wanted man after a fateful day in September 2001. It's actually the number one bestseller short read for young adults. Color me shocked. And it's available on Kindle for only 99 cents. And, hey, if you like my Intel Life t-shirt, that's available at Bunker Branding. Thank you guys so much for watching.
Hey everyone, new Ryan Macbeth t-shirts and hoodies from Bunker Branding are available. I'm going to get the Highmars shirt. What are you going to get, Donald? The Patriot shirt, because I'm a Patriot. It's the best shirt, the biggest shirt. Make 14 tangos great again. What are you going to get, Barack? Let me be clear. I'm going to get a drone sweet drone shirt. What about you, George? I'm going to get a try that missile shirt, because they're weapons of mass destruction. Oh, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because my presidency always blew up in my face. I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Ronald Reagan, but you're dead. I came back to tell you that no matter our politics, we're all Americans. And we should buy Ryan's hoodies and t-shirts because they pay for the stock footage and licenses that allow him to make awesome content. So come on down to Bunker Branding and buy a Ryan Beth t-shirt or I'll start the bombing in five minutes.